What's up, everyone? It's Contact with MoneyVest. So get ready for an insane week that's coming up from an earnings and economic standpoint. But not only do we have the unemployment numbers, the JOLS numbers, the GDP numbers coming out next week, but we also have just so many companies, including the Big Tech Magnificent Five, reporting their numbers, as well as a lot of companies in the S&P 500 coming out with their numbers as well. So this is it. We're pretty much wrapping up the month of October. Seems like the markets are still going to close out relatively strong. We're still down on the week for the S&P 500, very strong on the Nasdaq. So technology continues to lead this market higher, at least for right now, because we're seeing this huge rotation out of utilities, out of staples over to tech and semis and discretionaries. And uh, the inflation numbers are coming up next month. We've got FOMC next month. And the most important catalyst election is also going to be right around the corner so as always make sure that you drop a like and subscribe to the channel also do check out the links down below if you are interested in joining us i just posted our options portfolio update for week number nine which is officially over and this was the second best week for me personally on the back of of course tesla and nvidia so links gonna be down below we'll love to have you on board if you have any questions please let me know there's a few more spots open at the moment and that 16 percent annual discount which saves you two months gives you two months for free is available for a few more days so it expires on october 31st midnight so take advantage of it while it's still here there's a few more spots left if you're interested in joining us um and this right here is going to be my shopping list we've already built out the architecture for this and i will be releasing this before the end of october so i will be uh letting everybody know about my updated most recent shopping list that's coming out in october so by the end of this month you will have access to this on the website itself it's going to be a separate tab called shopping list where you can pretty much access all the list of stocks that i find myself to be very very high quality and of course what their fair value what their light buy heavy buys and no-brainer buy targets are going to be on this as well so again links gonna be down below would love to have you on board so first things first paul tudor jones says that all roads lead to inflation i'm long gold I'm long Bitcoin and I'm long commodities. He says that commodities are very, very underowned and all roads lead to some level of inflation increase. And I think I am to some extent very much on the same page as Paul Tudor Jones has been one of the greatest traders investors of our time. Um, and if you take a look at the amount of money printing, right, the deficits that we have seen from the U.S. Treasury Department over the last several years, it has only been accelerating uh, to the downside. So this is a very good representation of the U.S. running the largest deficits um, outside the pandemic years in fiscal 2024. So again, you know, we just hit $1.8 trillion. So that is going to be this number uh, right about here. Uh, but take a look at the increase in the deficits, which of course has been increasing the level of debt to well over 30 Five, almost 36 trillion dollars and what's happened since 2011 since we have seen a significant increase in the overall levels of deficits and of course the debt levels as well so this right here is really after 2010 2011 we've seen the gold prices um, excluding for u.s equities hitting on a relative basis new all-time high again and of course gold prices uh, trading back up to well over 27 2800 dollars per ounce so we are pretty much near record highs. And and so this is one area of the market where I don't mind dollar cost averaging into, I don't mind diversifying into. Uh, and Paul Duder Jones also mentioned gold as being one of the areas uh, and Bitcoin also one of the areas for an inflation hedge. And that's where he is really, really long on. So this is one area of the market that I really wanted to highlight because it's really uncorrelated, doesn't really get affected with what's going on with equities and real estate and the bond market and so on and so forth. But it really does seem to be a very nice uncorrelated diversification asset class, which I personally will continue to dollar cost average into. Now, before we go further into the report uh, on the yields versus stocks, because the 10-year rate has also been increasing. So if you come over to where the 10-year treasury is, sitting at well over 4.2%, which obviously is now starting to cause a little bit of a problem for the market. We'll go over exactly how much higher it needs to go before it becomes a much much bigger problem for the market. But before we get there, let's just quickly go over to the earnings and economic calendar. So this is what's coming up from an economic standpoint next week. So if I remove for the medium impact items, some of the surface level, some of the big line items you need to watch for is of course the Joel's numbers. That are, that's going to be scheduled for Tuesday, 1029. So that's going to be October 29th, Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern. We've got the Joel's numbers. The estimation is 7.92 million job openings 
in the U.S. We've also got the GDP growth number quarter over quarter estimates at 3%. That's exactly what Jeremy Siegel also sees a little bit over 3% for the uh, gross domestic product growth here in the U.S. And of course, the very important stuff is going to be scheduled for Thursday and Friday. So that's going to be wrapping up the entire month. So that's going to be 1031 Thursday. And of course, the first Friday of the month, pretty much November 1st, we've got the unemployment numbers. So we got the personal consumption expenditure. That's the PCE. That's the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. And uh, you'll notice the estimated month over month personal income 0.4%. Initial jobless claims expected at 231,000. So that's going to be coming out core PCE month over month expected a 0.2% increase, a little bit higher than the previous number. Uh, and year over year right now, we don't have any estimations for what that's going to be like. But next Thursday is when the PCE numbers, the Fed's preferred measure of inflation is coming out. And of course, we've got the unemployment numbers. So non-farm payroll is estimated 140,000 jobs with unemployment rate expected to stay steady at 4.1%, which Tom Lee also mentioned is going to be a very, very important print if unemployment rate continues to be very strong at 4.1, 4%, maybe even sub 4%, I think the Fed is really going to roll back on the possibilities of further rate cuts because, again, the, the economy is very, very strong and it doesn't really need a lot of rate cuts, right? The economy can sustain at these levels, at these rates, at, at where they are. And so, Tom Lee, Jeremy Siegel very much is expecting uh, a pause before the end of this year. He's only expecting 25 basis points worth of rate cuts additional in the next two meetings. So, in other words, one of those two meetings is going to be a pause, according to Jeremy Siegel. Uh, and Tom Lee, of course, says that unemployment rate next week, which is the upcoming week, is going to be very telling for where the Federal Reserve goes from here when it comes to interest rates. Now comes the most important thing, which is the earnings calendar and take a look we are packed we are absolutely packed it doesn't get crazier than this because we have in a one single week companies like google microsoft meta apple amazon eli Lilly, visa exxon mobile and chevron all of these companies reporting i mean just think about it microsoft over three trillion apple over three trillion Google and Amazon over $2 trillion. So that's $10 trillion right there with Meta over $1 trillion. That's $11 trillion right there. And then, of course, we got some of the other big guns here. Visa, Exxon, Chevron, Eli Lilly, AbbVie, AMD, McDonald's. If you scroll down a little bit further, we also got On Semi and Waste Management. We got American Towers. We also got PayPal reporting their numbers. We got Starbucks. We got Monster Beverages. We've got Chipotle. We got Mondelez, right? So the list goes on and on because we do have a lot a lot of companies, DoorDash, EA Services, Public Storage, Extra Space Storage, Super Microcomputer. You got Altria Group. Uh, so again, the list goes on and on. You can pretty much take a look at this on our MoneyVest website. But if you scroll all the way down, you'll find more companies. Kellogg's is reporting. Uh, and again, we go down in market cap as we go further down. So Twilio is also scheduled for Wednesday, it looks like, after the bell. So all in all, it's going to be a very, very important week. Google just under $89 billion of revenue with about $1.90 earnings per share expectations. Microsoft 316 for EPS, revenue $65.7 billion. Apple just shy of $97 billion, $1.50 at an EPS. And Amazon $160 billion in revenue with just over $1.16 in earnings per share. And Meta just over $41 billion with $5.35 in earnings per share. So that is all going to be on the schedule for next week. Now, coming over to the yields versus stocks discussion. Now, this chart essentially shows us how much do the yields really need to move on a one-month basis before it actually starts putting an impact on the S&P 500. So in other words, the yields need to move a two standard deviation in one month before it starts affecting the equity market. So historically, it's taken the 10-year treasury yield posting a two standard deviation move before stocks start to care. And that's changed roughly 60 basis points in the yield within a month. Over the past four weeks, the yield has moved up some 50 basis points. So if you come over to where the yields are right now, so you'll notice that you know pretty much from 3.75 uh, from the 1st of October, uh, it has gone up about 50 basis points, right? So that's a 50 basis point increase in the 10-year treasury. Now, from that very level, October 1st, if we go up to 60 basis points, which is going to put us at roughly over 4.3.5%, According to this chart, it essentially says that's when the, the market starts to really care. And you'll notice the performance of the S&P 500's one month return tends to go negative after we see a two standard deviation move in the 10 year treasuries. So after a 60 basis point move, which is going to be around 4.3.5%, the market tends to care a lot more. And of course, that's a negative move because the higher the yields go. So this right here is on the rates rising side. You can see the positive we go 
the more of an impact it puts on the overall market. Because again, markets are nothing but a multiple of future earnings. Um, and earnings depend very much on the risk-free rate because all future earnings discounted back to present, present cash flows and present value is going to be worth more if the rates are lower. And the opposite is also true. If the rates are higher, it's going to be worth less. And if the earnings are worth less, all of a sudden you've got a market trading at a higher multiple and that needs to be readjusted down if rates keep going higher. So hope that makes sense. And so that's why we have to be very careful with where the 10-year treasury goes because this is also built on the idea that maybe just maybe inflation could be accelerating back up or is on the verge of moving back higher, which of course we'll find out not next week, but the week following weeks here as the November economic reports start coming out. Um, and then of course the Federal Reserve will have a very important decision to make whether to lower rates, increase rates, keep them where they are because they're dual mandated essentially is focusing on both unemployment as well as inflation, right? Inflation is really what got us into this mess in the first place. So so that's where we are. Keep a close eye on the yields. Very, very important. Now, of course, we've talked about the Goldman Sachs expectation of the distribution of S&P 500 annualized returns over the next 10 years. They're very much forecasting about a 3 to 7% baseline return on the S&P 500 over the next 10 years. Um, there's been a lot of questions around this. I wouldn't pay too much attention to the next 10 years worth of forecast because analysts can't even predict for the next one year, let alone 10 years out. Uh, but the main main focus of this entire analysis, which I think on a short-term basis has more value than on a long-term basis, is very valid. And that is the starting valuation. Yes, the valuations are indeed elevated if you were to look at this cyclically adjusted PE multiple for the S&P 500 sitting at well over 38 right now. And again, this is episodes that exit valuations are stretched relative to fundamentals and macro variables. And uh, this right here, every time we see the S&P 500's forward valuations uh, at a really, really high level, the future returns are significantly lower. So what this shows us, in theory, the higher the starting price, meaning the higher the valuation, higher the starting price, all else equal, implies a lower forward return. And the current high level of equity valuations is a key reason our 10-year forward return forecast sits at the lower end of the historical distribution. The CAPE ratio currently sits at 38 times, which is at the 97th percentile since 1930. Uh, and that is suggesting for a significantly lower uh, rate of return on a 10-year annualized basis. Uh, Five-year annualized returns, of course, is going to be a little bit higher. One year is going to be slightly more than that. But the longer you go out, the lower that return is going to be because you're starting off at the very, very high multiple. Now, this right here is also something that we've been talking about on the channel, and that is the market concentration, which has gotten worse um, as the markets have become a little bit more risk on and very aggressive as new money is kind of flooded into the market. We've seen more and more accumulation of technology stocks, semiconductors, discretionary. So more recently, we've seen Tesla, uh, you know, the likes of Amazon, um, and of course, NVIDIA has been a big leader in this market. All these big companies have really just, you know, capitalized on this momentum, thereby making them over 35, 36% of the entire market, which is again, one of the highest levels we've seen in over 40 to 50 years. So that also is a very, very concentrated and narrow market momentum right now is what we're seeing because of the lack of breath here. Uh, they're also suggesting for the, uh, the lack of future returns in the S&P 500. Um, and again, for the fiscal year ending in September 30th, uh, this is more geared towards the deficits that the U.S. is running because this was uh, earlier to what we were talking about gold. Uh, of course, a money printing is benefiting gold. The U.S. government already added another $308 billion in the deficits in the current fiscal year, bringing the total federal debt to 35 0.8 trillion, just a little bit under 36 trillion dollars. So all in all, uh, you know, we've talked about market concentration. In fact, we have our own page on this, and this is the particular chart they're talking about: 36% for top 10, which makes up for over 19 trillion dollars. If you take a look at max seven, 32%. We're talking just under 17 trillion, and of course, the big three over 19 and a half percent, a little bit over 10 trillion dollars. So yes, uh, you know, there's both pros and cons to these types of market weighting and concentration. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, I think technology is going to continue to lead us higher as we become more efficient, more cost efficient, as margins grow, as earnings grow. In my opinion, I think over the next you know, three to five years, it's very difficult to predict what the market's going to do and where the returns would look like. Uh, but I, like I said, I'm very optimistic about the future uh, for the US, at least short to medium term. Longer term, though, I'm a little bit more concerned related to the deficits and the debt. And for me, I think gold and other forms of diversification, even emerging market. I mean, India, there's been a huge sell-off recently. 
uh, because of the China stimulus. Everyone's kind of taken money out of Indian markets to put it into Chinese stocks because of the huge shift and pivot over in China when it comes to quantitative easing and monetary policy. But I think it's just all cyclical. So there's going to be opportunities elsewhere uh, because the U.S. long term, I think the biggest risk and the biggest concern really is the level of debt, the deficits, the money printing and the bond yields definitely making it more and more difficult for equities to find any type of nice momentum here. S&P 500 more specifically. Now, coming over to SPX, uh, you know, we're kind of coming into the election uh, election week here. Uh, you know, it's going to be very, very close uh, over the next few weeks here. It's, uh, you know, the momentum is really building up. And if you take a look at where we are, uh, we're just kind of struggling to keep any type of momentum intraday. So support level is going to stay put at 57.65. That's the level that I'm really watching very carefully down to as low as 56.70. So if you do see any type of a, you know, three to 5% dip or a pullback in the market, to me, that's going to be a good buying opportunity. And that's exactly why I've got my shopping list coming up very soon so that you have a plan in place. You've got exactly, you know, high quality stocks that you can research and figure out, okay, whether it makes sense for you or not. And this right here is the NASDAQ composite, which is still trading within the context of this rising wedge. Again, we've got higher highs and higher lows. Resistance staying put at roughly 18,690. And we got a nice little higher low over here. Uh, for the Nasdaq as well, which I do believe it's possible that we kind of retest these lows here, 18.4, potentially even breaking down down to 17.7 as well. So those right there are going to be some levels to keep in mind, of course, for the market moving forward. Volatility continues to be a little bit more elevated. 6.55 is where we are on the day, 6.5% six increase back up to over 20. Um, and again, still pretty elevated, right? So this is again going to be built on the idea that elections are on the corner, FOMCs are on the corner. So we got lots to lots to keep in mind as we head into the next couple of weeks here with volatility being as elevated as it is. And money miss index is down to 3.64. We can double check that on our platform as well. So this is where we are, 3.61. This number may not have been updated, this one right here. Uh, but 3.61, we're still in the optimistic zone right now, which definitely does suggest uh, the risk reward is still somewhat unfavorable to be deploying capital at the moment. So here we go. Uh, let's get ready for yet another week. I will be live for most of the earnings calls and listening in to everything that we can get our hands on. Uh, but make sure that you drop a like, subscribe to the channel. Again, links to our Discord and Patreon is going to be down below if you want to get access to all the members-only updates, including all the courses, the members-only videos, options portfolios, trade alerts. Everything is going to be available with that 16% annual discount that does expire at the end of this month. So you got another few, few more days, four or five more days if you want to take advantage of that as well. Happy investing. I'll see you all in the next video.